Gospels get into a, a new series over the next few weeks. Acts 13 begins like this. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. On the move, you saw it on your, uh, on your bulletin cover, maybe on the way in. Uh, we, we want to spend a, a couple of weeks here looking at Paul's first missionary journey. So Acts 13 and 14 record these events of the Apostle Paul going out. And you notice his name didn't show up in the reading, but it actually it does. He's, he's still called Saul at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll get to that name change. That will come next week. But Saul uh, was called by Jesus. You know, he showed up on the Damascus Road, uh, if you kind of remember that story. And, uh, this, is a, this is some time later, uh, probably maybe 14 years or so down the road. And this is the start, if you will, of this first sending out of, of Saul, or the Apostle Paul, uh, on these missionary journeys. And we're going to look over the next couple of weeks at that first one. We're going to consider not only what it meant for the early church, but what does it mean for us as church? What does it mean to be on the move? So on the move is, is about mission. It's about being the church. It's about the body of Christ, and it's about being alive. On the move is about expecting the right things. And it's, it is indeed about this church in Antioch, and it's also about this church in San Lorenzo. On the move is about people like Saul and Barnabas, and it's about people like you and I. And so we'll take about five weeks to walk through some of the events that took place on that first trip that, uh, that Saul or Paul took. I'll consider where does it God calls us, and what does it look like when God calls us, and how do we respond when God calls us, and, and how do we see God at work in all of these things. But it starts, it all starts with just a handful of verses that I read this morning. Just those three verses. And there's a lot there for us to, to grab hold of and to kind of absorb for ourselves and understand. And what I want us to see in those verses really is, is what is the church? What, what the church is according to these couple of verses. So it started like this. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And so these, these five get mentioned right off the bat. We've got Barnabas and Saul, uh, and those names might sound a little more familiar. Barnabas shows up several places in Acts. Uh, he's got a, a Jewish background and became a believer in Jesus. Saul, uh, many of you know his story as far as he was persecuting those who believed in Jesus, and then all of a sudden the risen Jesus showed up on his, and as he was traveling to Damascus and, and told him, okay, you're, you're changing your life, and you're going to be a servant for me. And we assume that like immediately he goes off and, and becomes a missionary, but actually, like I said, it's been about 14 years, and, and he's really been uh, hanging out mostly in Antioch from what we can tell. Um, and so we have these two who have been connected in that way. And then we've got some other people mentioned. Simeon. We don't know a whole lot about Simeon. He doesn't show up elsewhere in the Bible. But he's, um, but he's got this sort of second name or nickname, which is a Latin word meaning black. And he's typically thought to be of African descent. Lucius is from Cyrene. Uh, Cyrene shows up in chapter 11. It's a city that many believers fled to. When uh, believers in Jerusalem came under persecution, they went to Cyrene. And it was people from Cyrene, and possibly Lucius, who came to Antioch and shared the gospel there. So it's how people in Antioch, it's how anyone in Antioch became a Christian was through this, this city Cyrene. And then Menaean. This one's interesting, I think. Menaean, it said he literally grew up alongside Herod the Tetrarch. So that note gives us insight into a couple things about uh, Menaean. One, he's from upper class nobility. Because if they were hanging out in the same schools and, and doing, if they were growing up together, there was a connection there. And it gives us insight into his age. He was probably about 70 years old at the time that this was written. And why point out those things? Why know those things about this group of people? Well, 
Well, I think Luke, the writer of Acts, includes this information in what he mentions about these men and these leaders because he wants, he wants the people reading to know who these people were. These are real people with, with real stories, with real background. They were, they were living, breathing human beings who were helping the church at Antioch to move forward. They had a diversity of cultures, of ages, of experiences. They were gifted by God so that they could bring his gifts to his people. And they were called together by God. And I want you to remember this about the church as we read that. The church is tangible. It's a real thing. It's, it's real people. It, it, the church is filled with, with real living, breathing human beings. It's, it, it's filled with a diversity of ages, of cultures, of backgrounds, experiences. And even in this room we can see that. And sometimes I fear that we, we lose sight of the fact that, that the church is tangible. We, we start to think and act as if the church is a really good idea. You know, as, as, if, as if the church is some sort of abstract and when you do that, you lose sight of the fact that you are the church. The church isn't something else out there that we strive for. You, you are the church. You're the body of Christ. I mean, sometimes I hear people talk about how they wish this or that person would, um, would, would connect with church. And, and on one level, I get it. Like, I, I know there's that desire to be, to be more connected or be in, maybe in this space on a Sunday morning. But I wonder if sometimes when we, when we talk about that, sometimes we lose sight of the fact that, that if someone's connected with you, they are connected to the church. But if, if you and I discount that, if you and I can't see that, then, then they won't either. So you get to bring yourself, you get to bring the church, you get to bring the body of Christ into the world and into the lives of, of people that we know. We try, to, we try to practice, I think, being the church, being the tangible church. It's, it's maybe one of the reasons why when I, when I hear somebody has, has questions or, or wants to know more about Calvary or our community here, those kind of things, I, I try to get in touch and, and, and try to meet face to face because I want them to know that, that more than being an institution or an organization or a time slot for worship, Calvary is a community of people because we are, we're the church and we're real people and there's, there's real relationship that takes place. It, it's why, so in, in three weeks we launch our uh, Spring Alpha course and it's why Alpha every week starts with a meal. It's not because people don't have time to eat on their own on a Sunday afternoon. It's because it's worth the time to invite people to speak to, to be together, to, to talk across the table with one another, and, and get to know and, and understand that, that, that the church is real people, that it's tangible. That's why I invited a group of guys to my house this past year. For seven months, we met on Wednesday nights, and the content that we covered and the book that we read, we could have done in about four or five weeks. But we moved slowly and we spent time together because it's worth, it's worth reminding ourselves that the church is real people. That it's, that it's something I'm connected to as I give myself to it, as I spend time with those real people. The church is tangible. So we see that in Antioch, and, and, and we keep reading in verse 2, and it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The, the call of the Holy Spirit... It's amazing. It's direct. And if you know the rest of the stories in Acts, you know that this kicks off some really amazing things, especially for Saul, who becomes Paul, and, and all that happens there. But actually, I'm going to say that part of the verse is pretty straightforward. It, it's it's kind of easy to understand, and I want us to focus for a minute on the first half of this verse. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. I want you to know this. The church is attentive. The church pays attention, pays attention to Jesus and his word and, and is, is watching for a movement of the Holy Spirit. The, the church is attentive to these things. And the, the setting in this story, it says they were worshiping and fasting. The setting here in Antioch is that they were gathered together intentionally. Like it was, it was, there was some intentionality, some uh, structure and form to their gathering. In other words, in English, we can say, we can use worship in a number of ways. And sometimes worship is fairly informal and sometimes spontaneous. 
I'll talk to some of you who say you like to listen to Christian music in the car because a song will come on the radio and you'll find yourself singing and, and you're worshiping in the car. And it's beautiful, that's wonderful. And that's one way that we use the word worship in English, very spontaneous, informal, spur of the moment. But that's not what the Greek word here means. And the Greek word points to something that was formal, or at least scheduled, it had some structure to it. There was intentionality behind it. In other words, this setting that we're reading about didn't just happen all of a sudden. It was on people's calendars. It was time blocked out. It was, it was time set aside for the purpose of gathering together, worshiping God, praying together, fasting. All these things were going on. We don't know if this was a Sunday morning or maybe another time during the week. We don't know if it was just the group of men listed or if there were more than likely probably some others gathered as well. But we know that worship was a priority. That people put it on their calendars. They allowed it to give shape to the rest of their day, the rest of their week. Not in a surprising or spur of the moment way. Sometimes we can get that a little bit backward, I think. We, we start thinking or acting as if, well, you know, when the Holy Spirit moves among us, then we will worship and pray. And, and really, it's, it's kind of the other way around. Because we worship and pray asking that the Holy Spirit would move among us. And that's what's happening in Antioch. They were regular in worship. They planned to worship. They prioritized time in prayer, even in fasting. And they were paying attention because the church is attentive. It's what the church does. It's what we do. We pay attention. We, we prioritize these things. We gather together this morning. We worship and we prioritize God's word and time with his people. It's what we do. We worship and we pray, asking that the Holy Spirit would move among us. And to that end, I'll tell you, I have an assignment for you this week. Because I want us to be attentive. And we're going we're gonna to be attentive by gathering together on Sundays. We won't, we won't stop that, certainly, and so this is part of that. But over the next three weeks, I want to invite you to pray daily. I want to invite you to pray for specific people each day. And I want, us, I want us to do this together, knowing that there are other brothers and sisters praying with us. And I'm going to talk more about that later in, in, in worship, but that's, that's part of how we are attentive to what God is doing. And we start looking for and asking for Him to show us where He's at work and what He might be doing and how He might work in our lives and the lives of people we care about. So I'll ask you to pray for people that you would like to see know Jesus better. Maybe they don't know him at all, or, or maybe they know him, but they've, they've kind of been distant. So I'm going to ask you to pray for people in your life, people on your heart, that you would like to see know Jesus better. We're going to do that together. We worship and we pray, and we pay attention, asking that we might see the Holy Spirit at work among us. So the church is tangible. The church is attentive. And then, and then what, if, what if the Holy Spirit moves? Well, that's the wrong question, isn't it? What happens when the Holy Spirit moves? He's not sitting still. He's, he's moving. So what happens when we see it? What happens when we, when we notice that? That's really what, what this story leads to, isn't it, in Acts? Because the, the Holy Spirit does show up. And, and just understand, the book of Acts doesn't record every single worship gathering that the early church had. So why, why do we get this one recorded? Is it, be, is it because God's people did something special or significant this time around? No, it's because the Holy Spirit did something special and significant this time around. So we're told the context, and we're told that this was happening regularly, and on this particular time, the Holy Spirit showed up in a way that really caught people's attention. Because God does that. His people gather, and we, we pay attention to His Word and to one another, and, 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 and He's always at work. And then every now and then, something really catches our attention. And we go, wow, we've been praying, we've been asking, and we hadn't seen something like that for a little bit. And so that's what this story is. And, and the story is recorded for us because God showed up in a significant way. And this is how the church responded. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They had a commissioning service. And notice, Paul, Saul, and Barnabas were ready to go. The congregation at Antioch, they were ready to support them. Everyone was, was very realistic, I think, about what this meant. That's maybe why there's some prayer and fasting once again. 
God's people responded to God's calling by asking for God's presence. Because the church is hands-on. Hands-on means going. Hands-on means actively supporting. Calvary has a lot of history with hands-on. A lot of history actually with, with hands-on very much like, like Barnabas and Saul were the ones sent, the ones who were going. I mean, I've, I've lost track. I've heard a lot of the stories, but I've, I've lost track of how many pastors, teachers, and other church workers have been sent from Calvary over the past 72 years. Not to mention all the, all the leaders who said yes to stepping out in a mission and leading God's people who, who didn't have an, an official call through our church body and didn't fill those titled roles that said yes to God's movement. And brothers and sisters here said yes, yes to God and they, they've allowed themselves to go. They've been ready to go just like, just like Saul and Barnabas. When the Spirit said set these two apart, they said yes, we'll go. And, and this congregation has a lot of history of being hands-on supporting, much like Simon called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaean, right? Because you've prayed. You've prayed for God's mission. You've prayed for those who've been sent out into the mission field and you've prayed over them. You've supported mission with your gifts. We'll have a chance again in, in about a month or so to, to start talking about how we're going to send a, a couple thousand dollars more to, to mission. We talk about our direct missions giving. We've been setting that money aside, and, and you'll decide, once again, how we support and where we support and where the Holy Spirit is calling you to, to send those gifts. This is also what it means to be hands-on as a church, to be involved in, in God's call. It's how God's people respond when the Spirit moves among us. We are hands-on, and, and what will that look like next? And some of you, some of you will be hands-on with, with Alpha coming up. And, and meeting and greeting people and, 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 and some will be in supportive roles around that. Some, some have been hands-on with other activities here like BBS uh, or, or Sunday mornings or, or hands-on in supportive roles, making sure that those things can happen, that people can come here for that. Others, if we look ahead, others will be called to something new over time. I don't know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll see some who are called into those official roles within the church and realize that God's calling me to step out and, and, and serve in this way or in that way. Some may be called, some of you may be called into specific relationships where you have opportunity to share your faith, where you have opportunity to witness. You're called into those things as well. When the, when the Spirit of God moves among us, we will respond and we'll be hands-on and some of us will go and some of us will support. We'll do this together because the church is tangible, the church is attentive, and the church is hands-on. And that's what we see in Acts 13, 1 to 3. But realize this. Acts 13 comes 13 chapters into the book of Acts. It doesn't stand all by itself. This isn't really just a story about an isolated event where a group of people got together and decided to do some things. It comes in the context of a much bigger story. It's not about people making themselves better by looking for Jesus. It's about Jesus making people better because he's been looking for them. And so there are reasons why the church can be all of this. And, and when we understand that, that setting for this story, we recognize that the church is tangible because our God is living. Because he's a real, living God. He's not an idea, and he's not a philosophy, and he's not a force. He is real, and he is your Father. He is your Savior. He is the Holy Spirit present here among us. He's personal. His desire for you to know his love was so great that he decided to become a human being. Jesus became a man and walked this earth. He took on flesh so that you could know God. He suffered and died in a real, physical way. He knew pain and he knew death. And he did this because you needed it. And because you, you are real. You're physical. You're flesh and blood people who struggle with pain and with death as well. And so he needed to meet those things for you and take that on. But he also did what you could not. Because he rose again from the dead. And he's given you and I a hope beyond death. You will live because Jesus is alive. 
You are the tangible church because Jesus is alive, because your God is alive. You're the real incarnate church, now and forever, because your God made himself incarnate, and he lives now and forever. And so the church is tangible because our God is living. And beyond that, the church is attentive because our God is speaking. He actually interacts with us. He's not far off and distant. We have to guess at what he might be thinking or doing. No, he's present with us and he speaks to us. And we gather to listen to him. We gather to listen for his voice because we believe that he speaks. And we pay attention because we believe God's spirit is present with us, living among us, giving shape to our lives as individuals and community because he speaks to us in his word. He speaks to us through brothers and sisters who share his love and his forgiveness with us. He speaks and he makes his gifts present in baptism, granting faith in his Holy Spirit. He speaks and suddenly bread and wine become carriers to bring to us the grace of God, to strengthen our faith and to draw us together as his family. See, the church is attentive and watching and listening because we really believe that our God speaks. And the church is hands-on. The church is hands-on because our God is working. He's at work in this world. He's at work in our lives. And when he calls you into his family, when he calls you his child, when he brings you into this family of faith, he doesn't just give you a place in the family picture. He gives you a place in the family business. His business is mission. <laughs> his business is drawing people to himself. And he gives you a place in that. He's at work in your life. We confessed our sins earlier. Earlier, He's at work bringing you forgiveness. He's at work gathering his people, his children, calling them to himself. He is the shepherd who goes out searching for that one lost sheep when the 99 are safely, safely put, put down for the night. And he calls you into that work with him. He's calling you to join him. Well, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, verse 10. And at the end of John's Gospel, Jesus says this to his disciples and to the church. Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. You are sent to carry on the work that our God started in gathering his people to himself. But you're not sent alone. But Jesus continues, it says, When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. You're not sent alone. You're sent into the work your God is doing. You're sent empowered by the Spirit. You're, you're sent to join Him. You are hands-on as the church because your God is working. Because He's working in you and He's working through you. And so, we as God's people are on the move. Just like we see in Acts. We're on the move because our God is on the move, because he's moving forward in this world, and he calls us to join him and to go with him. Some will be called, called out, and some will be called to serve and support those who, who are sent out. But we all, as church, are called by our God to be involved in what he's doing. So you are tangible, you are attentive, and you are hands-on because your God is living, he is speaking, and he is working. We're on the move because our God is on the move among us. Amen. Father in heaven, it is it's wonderful to know that we're called by you. It's also intimidating at times to know that we're called out because being called out means leaving what is comfortable. It means, it means moving into to unknown spaces at times. So strengthen our faith. Send your Holy Spirit among us as your people and encourage us as we walk together, as we pay attention for where you may be moving, you may be calling, where you may be at work, let us celebrate our place in your work. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen.